so remember, what, I, what I'm trying to do is build up the new hydrodynamic theory for active coral gel. And the point where I left you is that I gave you the entropy production. Conservation laws. There are two quantities which are conserved. One is the number of molecules. <coughs> and the conservation law for the number of molecules is just D and DT plus the divergence of the current equals zero. And this is the current of molecule. The second quantity which is conserved is momentum. Now, Yes. Why should momentum be concerned? Because we have motors that actually produce motion, right? But momentum has to be conserved. If you don't transfer momentum to some external surface or to some external world, the laws of mechanics tell you that momentum is conserved. But the total momentum is conserved. Right. There is. But I don't transfer momentum to anything else. If I would put some gel like this and I would do it at the end of the of this week or this lecture or next lecture, if I put it on the surface, then I transfer momentum to the surface, and then the total momentum is not conserved. But if I consider an isolated active gel, I don't take momentum out of it, so momentum is conserved. So the momentum equation, if it's a fluid, is a Navier-Stokes equation. So what I will have to do, and I don't like to do that very much, is to introduce indices for the coordinates. So my index would be alpha, and alpha is 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3 is x, y, z. So it's going to be an M, which is a density, D, D alpha D T plus D beta. This is the acceleration. And this is just a gradient of the stress. D beta. <laughs> Sigma beta alpha, or sigma beta alpha in the total square. Now, this doesn't look exactly like a conservation equation. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I still have a little bit of uh, conceptual trouble with the moment of conservation. I mean, if you're talking about an isolated system, the total energy must be conserved as well. <coughs> energy is not conserved because, of the, because I feed in energy with ATP. Exactly, but I mean, if you consider all of the components of the system, right, energy must be. It must be some kind of, uh, I, I, I kind of cheated with energy because I put things in contact with the reservoir. Mm -hmm. So I'm feeding energy such that I maintain the, the, the temperature. Oh, I see. So you're taking the time of the So the energy I, I take out. So I, oh, I have okay. energy going in and out of the system. Okay, but as far as energy is concerned, this is an open system. Momentum okay. is concerned, but I'm not taking up energy. The only way to take out momentum is to have friction on the surface. 
So I can make this look like a conservation equation if I introduce the momentum density, so G alpha, which is M M V alpha, and then you can rewrite the Navier-Stokes equation V V alpha D T minus D beta. So that's the flux of minus the flux of momentum. This is the variation of the momentum. And this sigma tilde is almost a stress which is here. The sigma tilde is the stress minus n n alpha d beta. This you can call the Reynolds stress if you want. It's just a transported momentum by the flow. So I have to include the transported momentum by the flow, and then the stress is just a flux of momentum. So that's what it is. And if you want to go from here to here, you just have to do that. So that's the only thing I need about conservation laws. The other thing I want to talk about is the thermodynamics. <coughs> As I said, what I want to write is the free energy as a function of what I call the polarization. In fact, I only care about slow variables, and the slow variables are only the orientation of the polarization. The modulus of the polarization is not a slow variable. It's not a hydrodynamic variable, if you want. And I can always choose it equal to 1. This will change the coefficient that we will introduce, but I don't lose anything if I choose it equal to 1. So in everything in the following, I choose modulus of t equal 1. And then what I need to know is how does the free energy varies with the orientation of the polarization. And that's a well-known question. This is how people write the free energy as a function of orientation for pneumatic liquid crystals. So that exists. It's called the Frank free energy. Gradients of P. Yes? I'm a little bit confused about the statement that the uh, modulus of P is not so variable, since it could describe something like a transition from an order to a different so, so it's a slow variable if I'm very close to a critical point. Now, if I'm not very close to a critical point, I can consider I'm well in the ordered phase, and then it relaxes in a finite time. If you're close to the critical point, the finite time diverges at the critical point, so you have to be more careful. So in a sense, I'm avoiding critical points. So the Frank free energy, F, is an integral over the volume. <coughs> and then there are three terms, K1, divergence of P squared, put one half here, plus K2, of P squared plus K3. Now you can get that from general arguments on rotation. I don't want to go into that. The only thing I want to do is tell you what it fits on me. And the simplest way to do that is to, is to show you uh, configurations of the polarization where one of these terms doesn't vanish. So the first term, K1, is called the display term. And the display term is something with P would go like this. You can plug a conf uh, configuration like this in here. You will find that this is zero, this is zero, and this one contributes. We measure the energy to display the vector like this. Uh, K2 is called the twist term. I'm not able to make drawings in three dimensions, so <laughs> twist is just this. So it's 
rotates let's say the given direction on the bottom surface and it rotates and you go up. That's twist. If you plug a twist in here, this vanishes, and this vanishes, you're left with that. Now, the other point that I want to make is that twist is a three-dimensional definition. So in two dimensions may exist, the twist doesn't exist. Now in most of the following, I will assume that the polarization is confined in two dimensions, so this term doesn't exist. And the third term is band. So it's something like this. So that's a band deformation. The twist is this. That's a straight deformation. No, just to ask, isn't there a line where the polarization has to be zero? I mean, the two. Well, well, what you're saying is if I make a defect, I mean, if I make a complete turn like this, I get a defect in the center. I don't need to do that. Locally, I can just play it a little bit and then come back to zero. Okay. But isn't that then? If I draw it like this, I will have a defect here. Yeah. I don't want that. I just want to play it a little bit. Uh, and then, having this free energy, I can calculate the field. Yeah, and then... This is a polar gel, right? Yes. <laughs> I didn't want to talk about that, but you will force me to talk about it. Uh, so what Ananyu is saying is that this is true. If I ask the free energy to be invariant when I change P in minus V, that's true for a system which is pneumatic. P and minus P are equivalent. For a polar term, for a polar system that's active, I can have a linear term, and the linear term has to be a scalar, so I should add here a term plus k diverging. Now the reason why I didn't want to write it is because, because of the diversion theorem, this term only exists on the surface. So if I study the bulk behavior, this term never counts. If I come back to your question, if I have a defect, there is a core of the defect, and then I have to worry about this term here. But strictly speaking, this term exists. So the field is just a derivative, so h alpha minus the functional derivative of f with respect to p alpha. Uh, this is a little bit messy. So I will do two things in the following that would make my life extremely simple. I will assume that the three constants are equal. So k1 equals k2 equals k3. And then, I, as I said, I will do it in two dimensions. <coughs> in two dimensions, k2 doesn't exist. I call that equal to k. And then, if I have a unit vector, this is x, this is y, the only variable is this name of theta. Now, small exercise, you plug, you plug this p into here, and you get something very simple. f is just some dr, or one half of k. So that's very simple, and from there it's very easy to calculate it here. Now, how do I do it? In practice, what I want to do is introduce two components of the field that I call H parallel, which is a component of the field which is parallel to the polarization. This is parallel to P. And H per perpendicular. Now their meaning is very simple. H parallel goes along P, so what H parallel does is fixes the length of P. H perpendicular is perpendicular to P, so it's a torque that rotates P. Now the only one that, we, that would be useful is this one, because I impose that modulus of P is equal to 1. So the first one I should care about is this one, then you can show easily that h per is minus the f is theta, and this is k minus, and this is k 
practical application. So in this two-dimensional case, life is very simple. Now, what do I do about h perpendicular? I want to impose this constraint that p is equal to 1. So I do it brute force. I will add the Lagrange multiplier that imposes that p squared is equal to 1. What I mean by that is that I introduce the Lagrange multiplier. in such a way that the modulus of t is equal to 1. So the only thing that h parallel will do in my calculation is that it will impose this condition because the modulus is not a hydrodynamic parallel. So that's very briefly speaking the thermodynamics of the problem. There's something else I want to say, which has to do with stresses in the non isotropic medium. studied continuum mechanics at page 1 or page 2, they told you that the stress is symmetric. And the stress is symmetric because space is isotropic. But if I have a polarization here, space is not isotropic. And the argument that tells you that the stress is symmetric doesn't hold anymore. So if I have a local polarization, there is some anti-symmetric component of the stress. Symmetric component of the stress, that's a torque. So in the system where there is a polarization, there are local torques, and not only do you have force balance, but you also have torque balance. Now, I don't want to go into the details of that. Uh, Sebastian Furtauer uh, yesterday told you that if you want to get what the anti symmetric part of the stress is, you have to write momentum, uh, kinetic momentum balance. I won't do it, but if you do that, you get a very simple answer for a non-chiral fluid. You get an extremely simple answer for the anti-symmetric part of the stress. So I call that sigma A alpha beta. And that's one half. So I have to look for the sign, because this time it matters. P beta. H alpha minus H beta. T so that comes from the kinetic momentum conservation. Uh, note that this is more or less a cross product between H and T, so it only depends on H perpendicular, which is what I was saying. What creates the torques is H perpendicular. So that's a slight complication that I will have to carry over. So with this, I can go back to the entropy production. And what I so I call that fluxes. Forces and universal. Now the thing I want to do is rewrite this entropy production in a more convenient way. So as Eko was saying yesterday, there's a couple of pages of algebra to do. There is nothing complicated to that, but I only give you the answer. So the answer is T is the T most, so it's pretty in volume. I still have the ATP term on that new. And then I have two other terms plus sigma alpha beta V alpha beta plus big P alpha H alpha. So the algebra is not complicated. You eliminate the time derivatives using the conservation laws, and then you integrate by part. And you get this. Then I need to tell you what the variables are. So this is the term that comes of ATP, hasn't changed. What I call V alpha beta 
is a strain rate, so it's a half of the alpha. It's the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. I will also need the anti-symmetric part that I call omega alpha beta, which is a half. So that tells you what V is. Sigma is what people call the deviatoric stress. So sigma total, the total stress, alpha beta. So one part of it is the pressure, so I can take that out, minus B, delta alpha beta. Another part of it is this one, anti-symmetric stress. So plus sigma A, alpha beta. And what's left is what I call sigma alpha beta. Now, if you have a simple fluid, there's no anti-symmetric stress, and this is just a viscous stress. So that tells you what this term is. H, you know, it's the molecular field, the orientational field. So the term left is this P here. P is the rate of change of depolarization. So P alpha is a time derivative of small p. However, it's not the partial time derivative, it's the total time derivative. So I note that with a big D. Well, this is what people call the convective time derivative. So it's a partial time derivative. Then there is a term due to translation. So plus V dot right, plus V beta, V beta P alpha. And then there's a term due to rotation. Now the term due to rotation is just plus omega alpha beta. Now maybe you want to see that written in a vector form, which is more common if you write dt dt. plus V dot grad T. Where omega is a local rotation, which is one half of the curve of the velocity. So this is one half of the velocity. So that's what, what you get. You get the entropy production as a sum of three terms. Now if you follow Gonzaga procedure, these terms are product of forces and fluxes. So I will identify three forces, like three thermodynamic forces of delta mu, T and H. And then I have the conjugate fluxes, R. R is the number of ATP molecules consumed per unit time, so that's indeed a flux. Sigma alpha beta, I told you, is the flux of momentum. And DPDT is just the rate of change of time. So let me write that down. So I have the forces here and the fluxes here. So for the force delta nu, I have a flux which is R. Now, one thing that will turn out to be important is if I reverse time, what happens to the forces? So delta nu is a free energy, it's a difference of chemical potential, so if I reverse time, delta mu doesn't change. So the signature of delta mu <coughs> when I reverse time is just plus one. Here the force is V, so V alpha beta. The flux is sigma alpha beta. But if I change time now, V becomes minus V, the velocity becomes minus the velocity and the gradient also are changing to their opposite. So if I reverse time, V alpha beta is changing to minus V alpha beta. So the signature with respect to time reversal is minus one. And then the third one, V 
is H alpha. Now H alpha doesn't change if I change time. It's DF dp, and f doesn't change if I'm time reverse one. So the signature is plus one, and the conjugate flux is just p. Now why do I talk about time reverse one? Maybe the easy way to think about it is to look at this couple here. If I impose a velocity gradient, if I impose a shear rate, I will have two components of the stress. I will have an elastic component that absorbs energy here in the state, and a dissipated component that dissipates energy. So what I want to do is separate <coughs> all of these fluxes into a reactive component and a dissipated component. How do I do that? The, the dissipated component is the one which has the same signature as the force. So I write this as sigma d alpha theta plus sigma r alpha theta, where sigma d has the same signature as the force. So if I do the experiment forward and backward, I dissipate energy in both directions. This has an opposite signature to d at this time which means if I do the experiment both, way, both ways, I get back the energy that I spent in the first way. So this is elastic, this is the simple. And I can do it for all of these, so this is equal to Rb, this is reactive, this is equal to P alpha, this is equal to P alpha, reactive. Now, another idea is once you've done that, you will write the most general relation between fluxes and forces, which is linear. So in all of this, what I'm doing is linear hydrodynamics, which is compatible with the time reversal symmetry and which respects all the symmetries of the problem. Now, what does it mean that I respect all the symmetries of the problem? Locally, I have one vector, which is the polarization. So anytime I need a vector, it has to be the polarization. So the only vector that I can have is P alpha. Then I would need tensors. So how many tensors can I make? There's one which is trivial, which is identity. So this is delta alpha theta. But with a vector, I can make one tensor, which is a quadrupolar tensor. So I call this Q alpha beta, which is p alpha p beta, and I want it to be traceless so I'm going to Can you see what I write here? Yes. So anytime when I write that forces, fluxes are proportional to forces, anytime I need a vector it has to be p, anytime I need a tensor it needs to be one of these two. And then what I want to do is write the most general possible relationship between fluxes and forces. So I just use symmetries, and I look afterwards what happens with that. So let's do it. something, but I, I don't know um, the term with the, the, the chemical potential and the um, mole molecular conservation. Yes. So what, what, what it became? What, what happened? It disappeared. No, I eliminated D and DT using the conservation equation. Yes, it's and it integrated by part. Okay. Then what happened to it? It came to the pressure. Now, okay. how does it go into the pressure? Another thing I wanted to hide for you, I was expecting this question. There's a magic thermodynamic relation which is called the Gibbs Dahlen equation. <coughs> this is 
what you learn in thermodynamics that comes from the extensivity of the free energy. And if you write it for a system with a polarization, it tells you that Nd mu equals dt minus So the chemical potential has gone away. I replaced it by the pressure. And the pressure has gone into the definition of sigma alpha beta. Okay. So the last trick that I want to do is I will have tensors and I will split the tensors into two components, the traceless part and the isotropic part. So I will write sigma alpha beta equals sigma alpha alpha beta plus sigma theta alpha beta, whereas this one has no trace. No trace means sigma alpha alpha zero. <coughs> Similar things, the velocity gradient, E alpha beta, so it's V tilde alpha beta, plus something that gives a trace. Now, the trace is just a divergence of the velocity. So if I want to write it plus delta alpha beta and something that I call u, u is just one third of the divergence. So u is one third of the gamma. <coughs> Why do I do that? Because I told you I have only two tensors. <coughs> this one is diagonal, and this one is traceless. So the diagonal parts have to be proportional to that and the traceless part have to be proportional to that. So I won't even trace these two tensors here. So what I want to do now is write the most general relationship between R and delta mu, sigma and delta mu. Between this variable and this one, so this is a big matrix, but I want to respect all the symmetries when I write this big matrix. So I split all the variables in two, which means I consider the dissipative parts, and then the reactive part. So let me start by the dissipative part. So I have four dissipative terms. I have sigma dissipative. I have sigma tilde alpha beta dissipative. I have p alpha dissipative. And I have r dissipative. So I said the dissipative part has the same signature <coughs> as the force. But of course, if I write it as a linear combination of the forces, it can also it can only include forces with the same signature as it is. Now this is a minus one signature for these two. The only force that I have with a minus one signature is a velocity gradient. So this two components of the stress here can only depend on the velocity gradient. Now there's a linear relationship between stress and velocity gradient and the proportionality constant is a viscosity. Now, of course, it's a matrix, so I would have to write the big matrix here and respect the symmetries here. I won't do that. I will do it as for a simple liquid. So I would say there are two viscosities. This one is eta bar times the divergence. And this one is eta. I only consider two of these terms. For an incompressible system, so when u is equal to zero, for a liquid crystal, you have three independent viscosities. The reason why I'm cheating a little bit is that if you introduce all the viscosities you don't get in physics, so it will force me to write huge equations, and there's nothing that comes out of it. So I'm cheating a little bit, but you can try to play the game. How do you make the most general matrix between sigma and v with these constraints here? that any vector is Q, any tensor is Q. Uh, I think you get five discussions. We did it, of course, but it doesn't count very much. <coughs> so more interesting is these two. So these have a plus one signature, so they can depend on the two forces that have a plus one signature. 
So there is H. And that's the loop. Now this is a vector, this is a vector. So there is one constant here that I call one over the other one, just to do with anybody else. This is a vector, this is a scalar. So if I want to make it a vector, I have to multiply it by a vector. And the only thing I have is p. <coughs> so what should appear here is p alpha, and then there's a phenological p factor that I call now. This is a scalar, this is a scalar. So I call this one big lambda. Or d has to be proportional to h alpha, but h is a vector, I want to make it a scalar. So I have to put a p alpha here. And there's a prefactor. Now what Onzagoras proved, which is called the Onzagoras symmetry relations, is that if you work at linear order, the cross terms are equal. So the prefactor that I should find here is equal to the prefactor that I have here, so it's just now that. So here are my relations for the dissipative fluxes. I had to introduce three new coefficients. Let me finish with that and then I'll discuss all these coefficients. Can you just read them one more time because I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about your so, so relations. You to do? Just, just read them one more time. One more time? <laughs> yeah. So this one you got. Yeah. This one I cheated. Then I say this as a plus one symmetry for the first time. And the only forces that it can depend on are the forces that have a plus one symmetry. So H and not to Okay, that's your H alpha. So P alpha needs to have H alpha here. That's a vector, so there's only one constant here. This one is a scalar. If mm -hmm. I want to make it a vector, I have to not have it. And then the other trick is that these two coefficients are equal. Mm -hmm. And that's what Gonzaga tells you. Everybody agrees with that? Yes? So this one yeah. is a trace. So it's a scalar. And I say it only depends on the you has to prove that doesn't have any points here. I mean, that's what I mean. Okay, this is a U. Are you happy with that? That's a scalar, you do the scalar. That's what you have for simple fluid. That's what that's a shear viscosity, and that was called the longitudinal viscosity, which to me was for a long time a mystery. I spent a long time opening any hydrodynamic book I could find to get a number for that. Now people that do ultrasounds measure that. So in the end, in my university there was somebody who did that, he did the numbers. Which is the same order as this one. So there's nothing special about it. In many cases it doesn't count because the trace of the stress you can include in the pressure. So if your system is incompressible, this is zero. And even if it's not incompressible, you can include that in the pressure. So in most cases you don't care about that. So second thing is the reactive fluxes. So I have the same one, sigma v reactive, sigma sigma beta reactive. Sorry, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yes. I can't read, so P A D. This one is P A D. Yeah, so then it's H A divided by what? By a constant that I call gamma 1. Oh, it's just a constant. Okay. It has to be a number. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I come back to this constant. Okay, no, no, I tell you what they mean. Yes? I have a problem. The cross term usually is between terms of the same tensorial order, but now it's. It not still works. Really. So it still works. The idea is if you, calculate, if you plug that into the dissipation, you should get the same contribution from both. So if I multiply this by H, and if I multiply this by delta nu, I should get the same contribution. So it's more general than what you're saying. So reactive terms. And we start by this. Well, that's a scalar. And it has the opposite signature as this one. So this time it's plus one. So I have two forces with plus one. That's a new. 
each icon. So I want to make it a scalar, with the constant, and I call it minus it above. This one I want to make a scalar, so I have to multiply by t alpha here. And I call the constant new one. <coughs> this one, same thing, should depend on delta mu and h alpha. This is a tensor with no trace, and this is a scalar. So I should multiply it by a tensor with no trace, and I only have one. The only tensor with no trace that I have is this. So whatever I do, here's as a factor q alpha beta, and there's a coefficient that I call minus two. So this one is h alpha, and I want to make h alpha into a tensor, a symmetric tensor with no trace. So one of them is h alpha p beta plus p alpha h beta. That's symmetric. But then I have to subtract the trace. So it's minus. And the coefficient here I call mu 1. Just by using my symmetry, I can guess what the stresses are. And then I have to do the same thing with this two. So P alpha R and R P. Now they have to depend on things with a minus R R. With a minus signature. So they have to be proportional. This one will be <coughs> alpha beta or the trace. And this one, same thing. Now, what Mr. Gonzaga tells you is that for the dissipative part, the cross coefficients have to be equal. Now, for the reactive part, they have to be opposite. Because if you recalculate, the entropy production, only the dissipative part contributes. So the prefactors here, that couple P to V, should be the opposite of the prefactors that couple sigma to H. The prefactor that couples U to P should be the opposite of this one. And that fixes this four coefficients. So I won't, I don't want to mess it up, so I put it in my notes. This one is minus U1 bar P alpha plus U. And this one is minus U1 P beta plus P alpha beta. And this one is zeta bar. And this one is zeta. The fact that I use a scalar and a tensor here is just a tensorial symmetry of the problem. The fact that I put a plus sign here and the same coefficient is here is that what Andrago tells me is that for the reactive part, the cross coefficient shouldn't be equal, so it should be exactly opposite. Now you can check that if I take these four equations, plug them back into here, there is no contribution of the reactive part. The reactive part conserves energy and then they don't contribute to the entropy production. So with this game, I did exactly what I wanted. I have the most general possible relationship between sigma t and r as a function of delta mu, v, and h. And the only thing I use is symmetry. Um, now, in most of the following, I will simplify this stuff. If you count the number of constants, constants that I introduce, one, two, uh, three, four, five, and all of these, I introduce at least 10 material properties, and that's too much. 
So I will simplify that. Gamma 1 is called the rotational viscosity. Now, what does it mean? It means if I rotate the polarization, I dissipate energy, and the coefficient that tells me how much energy I dissipate is gamma 1. So, gamma 1 is positive. Moreover, it's homogeneous for viscosity. And it's different to the other viscosity. Yeah. It's different from the other one in principle, because I got them like this. Now, in an entangled polymer like actin, 
Although I don't have any microscopic model, my guess would be that there was the same order of magnitude. I can't tell you whether it's two eta or one half of eta or ten eta. But any reasonable guess, in my opinion, would give you the eta and the other one are the same order of magnitude. So I took care of this one. The other one I want to discuss now is new. So new one is what people call the flow alignment parameter. <coughs> the one is well known in liquid pressure. It couples <coughs> the stress to the orientation. Now there's a very simple experiment in which you can measure the one. Suppose I take two planes. And I manage to align the actin filament in such a way that they're perpendicular to the surface. So P is vertical. Then I shear. If I shear, what happens is that the orientation of the actin filament turns and it turns by an angle of paper. Now it's a classical exercise in liquid crystal physics to calculate theta. I won't do it, but you could do it from these equations here. And what you find is that cosine two theta is one over nu one. So when I shear, what nu one gives me is how much do I <coughs> tilt the orientation angle. And that's this angle theta, which is here, that gives no one. Now, if you're more careful, if cosine two theta is one over new one, new one over new one should be smaller than one, otherwise you're in trouble. So that imposes that the absolute value of new one is larger than one. I don't understand why the, the angle doesn't depend on the shearing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm mean. If you are Doing the experiment like this, you shear. <coughs> the shear rate goes away, and the angle is independent of shear rate. It only depends on one of the constants that I told you about, which is this new one. So this is how people measure it. I must admit that I have no idea of what new one is for acting. Nobody ever measured it. My guess is that it's all over one, but I have no proof of that. Uh, there is no general theorem that this is satisfied. I mean, there is no general rule in my derivation that tells me whether new one is smaller than one or larger than one. <coughs> what this means is that the other case exists. Now if you do the experiment in the other case, you share like this, and new one is smaller than one, there is no steady state. The orientation is tumbling all the time. So the case new one smaller than one is unstable, and you have a tumbling of the orientation. Excuse me, how are you sure that new one is not a function of the shear itself? How oh, can you make sure? That's a very nice question. So what I've been doing from the beginning is that I've been doing a linear hydrodynamic theory. So in a linear hydrodynamic theory, all the relationships have to be linear. And I already have one of the forces here. Oh. So there cannot be any force dependence. Mm -hmm. Now what you're saying is that if I apply a very strong shear, for instance, mu1 might start to depend on shear. But if I go in this nonlinear regime, I mess up a lot of things. Now, some of the things I messed up, I told you I forgot the renal stress and stuff like this. You can keep them, that's no problem. Uh, what you mess up is the Onzager symmetry relation. So, what Onzager tells you is that for linear hydrodynamics, the cross coefficient has to be equal in the dissipative fluxes and they have to be opposite in the reactive fluxes. But nothing is known when it's nonlinear. So you might say, I could go beyond that and start to write the quadratic terms and stuff like this. I won't do that. It's a nightmare. You know? Because the coefficients I have, I think they're older. If I go to nonlinear order, I will get hundreds of coefficients. So the strategy which I like to apply is in the, in the physical cases that I know where nonlinearities are important, I will just add them by hand. 
and I'll show you one example tomorrow. Okay? So I use a linear theory. I know that it's approximate, but whenever I know that nonlinearities are important, I will put them back in. It turns out that, as I told you, if delta nu is zero, this is thematically the crystal hydrodynamics, and that works extremely well. As far as I know, all of the experiments that have been made can be explained on nickel crystal resistance. Now, if I forget about P, I should have even said that in the beginning. If I forget about P, I only have that. So what I derive to you is the hydrodynamics of a simple liquid. Now, the only thing I ignore is this nonlinear term. You can see them, and they go exactly what it's equal. Um, so that's new one, and it tells you how the stress depends on the local orientation. Or it tells you how the local orientation depends on the velocity rate. Because on the dagger symmetry relation, this is related. Now, the last one I want to discuss is this zeta. by molecular motors. This is the only thing new in my story. All the rest is liquid crystal hydrodynamics. So the only new term is this one. The only thing I added is one coefficient, which I call the activity coefficient. That tells me that as long as I have energy consumption, so as long as my system is eating ATP, there is a stress like this, and I only got that from symmetry argument. I never made any model of molecular motors. Whichever model of molecular motors I make should give me something like this, except that it should give me the explicit value of zeta. So a naive guess, yes? You added also the lambda term. I added the lambda term. I'll come back on the lambda term afterwards. This one also has a simple interpretation. Now, lambda I can always include into zeta, so it doesn't change okay. very much. But yes, you're right, and I can discuss lambda afterwards. So that's the stress produced <coughs> by the motors. So what I told you yesterday is that if I have an active gel like this, I have motor clusters, they go to the cross links here. and they contract the gel. So I know that this is a contractile stress, but the only way I know it is from experiments. For instance, this experiment that I showed you yesterday of the acting gel in the tube where I was tuning ATP at times t equals zero to induce water, where so you saw the gel that was contracting tells me that this stress is contractile. Now it's a little bit unfortunate. The first time we did it, we wrote it like this. And to make it contractile, zeta has to be negative. So we know this stuff. Because I want the stress to be contractile, because this is what experiments tell me, zeta is negative. And then I'm too conservative. I never dare change, because I will make a mistake all the time. <laughs> so, if you want it to be contractile, it should be that. There is no theorem, though, that it should be contractile. The only coefficient that I know are positive are the diagonal coefficients. This one is positive. This one is positive. This one is positive. There is nothing on zeta. So you have to rely either on experiments or on molecular models. 
So there are a few around, and people know the answer. So of course, you always find it negative. Yeah, Sorry, so does that mean that they only pull, they only pull in this way, and they never push? Is that what you're saying? Uh, that's exactly the point that I wanted to make afterwards. What I told you is that the filaments are oriented. Okay. So each of the filaments has an arrow. And you agree that if I change the sign of the arrow, instead of pulling, it should be pushing, which is exactly what you say. So what I'm claiming is that on average, the effect of that is contractile. It's not at all obvious. Now, we made a few attempts to make molecular models. Indeed, you can find it contractile, but you have to invoke nonlinear elasticity of acting. If you invoke only linear elasticity of acting, you don't find anything. So it's kind of a complex issue. Uh, there is one thing you can guess, though. I say zeta is associated to that. So to make a contraction, I need a cluster of motors. So at least it should be proportional, so it should be minus. It should be proportional to the density of motors. But to create contraction, I need cross things. So I need two actin filaments. So the naive guess is that it goes something like this. That's the naive guess you can make. But then there is a prefactor. And to get this prefactor, you need a real molecular model. Is that OK? The main point is that, is that I didn't make any model of molecular model. And what I'm claiming, which is true for all the models I know, is whichever model you make, you should find something like this. The only output of the model is the contractility at zeta. It's the same thing as when you general hydrogen atoms. <coughs> if you make molecular model of fluids, you will find the viscosity. It will be positive. What your microscopic model will tell you is how does this viscosity depend on the molecular parameters of the fluid. So this is why I tend to call this zeta a transport coefficient, the same way as zeta as eta is, except the sign of this one is not fixed. Lambda. I know it's that. Uh, the last comment, though. Uh, I told you that this was very general because this is based only on symmetry arguments. So I could apply the same kind of theory to bacterial suspensions. Now, for bacteria, the two cases exist. Whether they push through it or they pull through it in, will give you the two possible signs of zeta. And I think the classical bacteria, E. coli, has a positive zeta, which pushes. It's an extensile stress and not a contractile stress. A lambda. Now, if you look, At this equation, lambda act like H. So lambda is some kind of active field. So it's an active longitudinal field. Depending on its sign, it can align the filaments or, or unalign them. Now, the naive picture you can have is suppose you have two filaments like this, you put a motor here. That bind on these two filaments. If it walks in this direction, it will, <coughs> so it will make them parallel just because it walks in the right direction. So that would be my naive interpretation of lambda. And all of the following, I will ignore lambda, and there is this assumption here that I can include it in zeta. So in the end, I made all this mess for one parameter, which is active coefficient zeta. <coughs> you will see that this creates very funny properties to the fluid. If you don't put zeta, everything is kind of normal, except it's an isotropic. If you put this term here, you create a weakness. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that 
you need to do all that. There is no way you can derive a stress like this from free energy. So you need to do this non-equilibrium theory, and this is actually non-equilibrium theory. You cannot derive such a term, at least I cannot derive such a term for the free energy. So in the following, the only thing that we care about is what, is, what does this active effects do to the negative field. Uh, so that's almost the end of the general law, except that I assume that the relationship between the forces and forces were local in time. So I implicitly assume that the active gel was fluid. Now what I told you yesterday is that active gels are not fluids, they are viscoelastic. So what I need to do is redo this theory here for viscoelastic system. I won't do it, I will give you the results. And the reason why I won't do it is that for all of this I had no choice. Which means as long as I decided I made a linear hydrodynamic theory, I have to find a structure like this. To include the viscoelasticity, I need to make choices. So I need to make models along the way. So it's less interesting in the sense of this right now. So let me <coughs> just tell you a little bit. About this way, that's the active gels. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, if you say that this is contracted, I, I mean, asking the question. I'm asking Sorry. the question. <laughs> if you're saying that this is contracted, then um, in some points, yes, you are contracting, but in other points, it's going this way. So, so it's a little bit confusing. So what you're telling me is that on average, it's going to be contractile, but then I will have maturation around that. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that in all of these things, it's not So we, I didn't say no, no. But in a sense, what you're saying is that in a gel like this, I will have thermal fluctuations, but I will have also fluctuations which are due to the contractility. Mm -hmm. But there is no equilibrium in those. I agree with that. Uh, so let me talk about this elasticity, and then I'll discuss all the effects that I know, and this is one. System, so passive viscoelastic. <coughs> the simplest model that I know for viscoelastic gel is something called the Maxwell model. What the Maxwell model gives you, it was called the constitutive equation. Constitutive equation is the relationship between the stress and the velocity gradient. Now the <coughs> constitutive equation of the classical Maxwell model is sigma stress. It's an isotropic <coughs> system, so sigma is symmetric. This is a relationship between the stress and the velocity gradient. What's, so the, the, what's the coefficient before the d, d, d? Sorry? Tau. Tau. Is it tau? Sorry. It's a tau. Okay. I, I can't do it. That's his tau. Suppose I take a system like this and I apply a shear. So I, I apply a step shear. At short times, this term is negligible. So d sigma dt is the velocity gradient. But the velocity gradient is just a time derivative of the deformation. So at short time, after a step shear, If I integrate that, I get tau sigma alpha theta equals 2 eta 
times u on Fadiga. Or if you want, the stress is proportional to the deformation. And that's just a solid. It's a solid where the young modulus is a key. So this is a relation that Maxwell's model gives between the shear viscosity and the shear modulus. Eta is eta. Maybe I should say the shear modulus and not the young modulus. But if I look, I study my system at home times. At some time, this term is becoming different, and sigma is the of the velocity. So at long time, it's liquid, means it flows. It's elastic at short times, and after a, short, after a certain time, it flows, and it flows with a viscosity. Okay. In the sense what I'm describing with the Maxwell model is a complex fluid that first reacts as a solid and then flows. Uh, the problem is this Maxwell model is a guess. And if you want to compare it with real materials, then you have to do a microscopic theory. So I'm a little bit biased because I worked on polymers for many years. So the only model that I know is a reputation model. Now, in the reputation model, there is not only one realization time, but there is a spectrum of realization time. However, if you look at not enough times, it's almost well described by a micro model. The elastic modulus at short time, the stress of viscosity divided by the rotation time, and then there is a small prefactor here, small, six fifths or five sixths, I don't know, but something like this. So the only model that I know, which is for far known else, doesn't satisfy exactly because there is a spectrum of realization. Now what I showed you yesterday is this rheology experiment on the cell, where you saw that the complex modulus was growing like a power of the frequency. And what I told you is that this is a signature that there is a broad distribution of realization. So if I were serious, what I would have to do is introduce a broad distribution of relaxation time and plug that into my active gel model. Uh, I haven't done that. And the reason why I haven't done that is that I don't know any explanations for this world distribution of relaxation. So I'm sure it exists, because it's experimental. So everything I will tell you on this elasticity will be based on this Maxwell model, and it's only qualitatively correct. So then what you have to do is redo the whole thing for this elastic system. I won't do it. I will just write the constitutive equation that one gets. the equation for the stress, which is 2 theta d alpha theta. So that's the equation relating the total stress, so I sound the dissipating and the velocity part to the velocity gradient. So if I forget about all the second line, this is just a Maxwell model, there is one complication though, which is that I replaced the partial derivative here with a convective derivative here. 
And if you put a convector derivative, you ensure rotational invariance. So this is the only thing I did. Uh, so that's the Maxwell model. This is the active stress. And this is the flow. <coughs> if I want to get what I had before, I just need to let tau equal zero. And it's always liquid. So summing the equation that I had before is that. So I need to be flexible and ignore the lambda. And I ignore all these factors do and bar and different. So there are three components to the stress. Viscosity, activity, and complete orientation. Then I have the same kind of equation for the here, polarization. So dp alpha over dt is 1 over gamma 1 times 1 said is that the V has lost its tilde because the trace is zero anyway. So from the progressive system, V and V tilde are the same. Same thing, if tau is equal to zero, this is what I got before. This is the rotational viscosity, and this is the <coughs> term associated with that here. Uh, now I made one choice is that there is this coelasticity of the rotation and there is this coelasticity of the translation. And what I did is I assumed that there is only one time. So I use the same time, relaxation time for translation and rotation. Which to me seems to make sense if I use some kind of rotation model. So that's the equation that I'm using the following. Uh, now the last thing I want to do is I want to make comments on what I did in the information that I made. half of them go to the left. So the average value, I, I remember I told you that I defined T as average value of the unit vector on each element. If it's thematic, it's zero. However, you need to find an order parameter that tells you that the elements are parallel. But this order parameter is what I call Q, so you have to define Q alpha, beta equals and this is not zero for a, for a lematic model. So you can redo the whole theory by letting t equals zero and q not zero. In fact, it doesn't change anything. Now the way you check that it doesn't change anything is that if you look at these two equations, there is no problem. I mean, if I replace p by minus p, this doesn't change, this doesn't change. The only thing that comes in is Q alpha, Q alpha beta, that's P alpha T beta. So if I change P minus P, this doesn't change. P changes to minus P, but A changes to minus H. So this equation is on board. This changes to minus P, but this changes to minus H, and this changes to minus P. So the way I did it, the so theory is not polar. So using pure linear hydrodynamics, I don't get any polar terms. Now you can add non-polar terms by hand. So the way you have to do it is to add non-polar terms in this equation. And the simplest ones you can think of 
on the four lines. Okay. In this in this equation here, you can add nonlinear terms that make the theory over. But the simplest ones you can think of is terms like W1. They have to be active. That the new P dot y applied to P. Now there are three terms like this. It's kind of just W2. And I'm telling you uh, P. I'm sorry, I'm of P. And the third one is W3. So if you add these terms, they are square root p. So when this changes sign, they will change sign. And these are actually polar terms. This one doesn't count if I let p square root as 1. Uh, this one changes a bit the physics. This has been studied in detail by Christina Marquez. In fact, the way she did it is she started, started from a molecular model. And she got terms like this, and then she came to us shouted that we didn't do it correctly. We <laughs> had a lot of time to convince her that this is not a linear term because it has delta nu and grand p. So as far as forces are concerned, it's the square of the forces. And it's true that it changes a bit the physics. So maybe you should keep this term, otherwise you won't get the right. At least for some systems. Uh, the third thing you can do is you can add noise.
Now, I don't know many of the parameters. Like, I don't know what the new one is, I don't know what the bending modulus scale is, but I think I don't know all of them. So, yes, we have some qualitative behavior, but we don't have any detailed composition to any experiments. Um, one of the big assumptions that I made is I told you I have this messy actin, myosin, water, and whatever you want all the proteins around. And I decided that this was a one-component system. Now, you can do the same theory for a multi-component system. It's extremely heavy. There's one effect that you get, though, that you don't have in the one-component system. is Actin is a gel, and there's water in there. But there can be a relative motion between water and the gel. It's called permeation. The way I did it, I just killed the permeation effects. So that's a new effect that you get if you move on to component theory. It's not easy. It's pretty involved to do that. Uh, I think a good way to do it is what was done recently by one of our hosts, Andrew Callan Jones. Who's Frank Hughes? They have a paper which has just been submitted where I think they do it correctly. Uh, other thing that I thought you should be important and that I didn't introduce is Kalmin. Which means I never introduce in the theory the fact that the actin filaments are polymerizing and depolymerizing all the time. The way we did it, and I show that to you tomorrow, is we use treadmilling as a boundary condition. So we only consider polymerization and depolymerization of the surfaces. In some cases, this is clearly correct. In many cases, this is not the case. So one would have to think carefully about treadmilling. There are days when that. One of these days, you might come and with a, with a theory of that. <laughs> um, you heard yesterday night, from Christian that you can generalize that to polar systems, to polar chiral systems. Uh,